All right, this is Carl, also known as Zeropath in the Custom Magic community, back again for our final custom standard set review. Um, it is that time. We have finally reached the end of the alphabet and reached Vestum, a set by Ruben. This is a set that's been nominated for the custom standard rotation before. Um, it has some really fascinating mechanics. It's a bottom-up post-apocalyptic set where all mana is slowly draining from the plane after a massive disaster. Uh, let's start talking about it. Again, this is for the custom standard rotation. So this is, uh, we're coming up on the vote to see which set we want to rotate into custom standard. Custom standard is a format made entirely of magic sets made by custom designers. So none of these cards are from wizards. And uh, the villain set by PR is rotating out, and we're we have ten sets that have been nominated to rotate in. And this is the last one that I'm going to do a video review of. I've reviewed all ten. I didn't quite review my own set in Atropolis, but I did do a video talking about the constructed implications of a few of the cards just to give some insight into what my thinking was. Um, so I invite you to check that out. Check out the other videos for the other sets if you're interested. And hopefully this is helpful to those people looking to vote, helpful to people um, just looking to see more custom magic cards in general, and also helpful to the designers of these sets. So uh, I'm glad to be here about to, to do the last video review. I think it's been um, interesting for me at least and hopefully helpful for others. Okay, let's go through the cards. Angel of Dismay, 4 mana, 3, 4 flying, and you can put minus 1, minus 1 counters on all their tapped creatures. So this can get rid of a bunch of tokens or just kind of neuter their board if you're trying to stabilize. And then they can't attack or block unless they pay mana. So this is uh, a real stabilizing force that isn't a sweeper necessarily, but can help you get back into the game. I could see this in like some kind of Abzan mid-range or something like that. Um, decks tend to be going wider now. There's a lot of uh, you know aristocrats and token stuff going on in the format right now, and so something like a Garrick isn't always going to be the best on turn four. Like making a beast and having a planeswalker left over is always going to be good, but something like this can that can immediately affect them and make it hard for them to attack could be uh, could be pretty good. So I, I approve of this uh, mid range tool. Um, there's a humans matter theme which I really dislike in Vistum. It's probably the thing I like the least. I just don't think we need to be pushing humans or human tribal. Uh, in magic. I think that's not good for the game. Okay. Wastes. Waste all lands you control. So this is a three mana board wipe. Very strong. Uh, but you have to turn all of your lands into wastes. And this is the really exciting part of this set. Just the ability to uh, spend not mana but to spend the color of your lands and the spike in me really loves that the Johnny in me really loves that it makes me want to figure out how to build a deck around it um, and it allows for some really push designs like Fall of Athanas so I'm a big fan of this uh, I'm trying to think you know would your standard control deck want to run this be willing to run this if it meant wasting all your lands. Depends what else is in their deck, I suppose. Like, this helps you stabilize. What if you can't cast your spells afterwards? That's kind of a problem. So I think you really need colorless cards in your deck, like artifacts that maybe help you find lands or uh, things of that nature to help you uh, then be able to cast your spells. So this stabilizes really well in one way, but it also handicaps you from stabilizing with your plays afterwards. So it's an interesting card to, to evaluate, and I think it'll play interestingly too. Normally after a board wipe, um, aggro decks are kind of out of it if they've gone wide and their board's been destroyed. But if they can bank on their opponent not being able to cast spells for a couple more turns while they you know try and find their blue or white sources again, 
uh, the door isn't all the way closed, and that's what I like about that design. Uh, this is a 5 mana 4-4 four, four Flying Vigilance that might be also be indestructible if you have other creatures going on. I don't think it quite gets there, but it is strong. This helps stabilize in a similar way to the 4 mana one, in that it punishes them for dealing damage to you, but only after they've already dealt damage. So it might not stabilize quickly enough. Uh, you can't lose if you have other humans. Not really appealing to me. This is the 2-1 one for 1 that seems to be in every set, but it has an interesting uh, bonus here of an activated ability that gives you more bodies. Which, you know, it's interesting to have a mana sink on your 2-1 one for 1 as opposed to just some random uh, hate bear ability. So I approve of that. Uh, this could see play, like, in an aggro deck where you can, you're losing your creatures, you can return them to the battlefield after a wipe, and then regain the card that you spent later. This is a hate bear. Well, it's not a bear, and it costs three mana, but you can hate a specific card, which is an okay tool to have. I think these really expensive salvage spells probably don't see play unless they're like a, a major combo piece of something else. Like this returns all your creatures with CMC 2 or less. And if you cast a salvage cost, like if you self mill this and then later pay 7 mana, um, you get Nomads for each creature you control. The ideal play pattern is to play this on turn 6 and you have all these creatures, then on turn 7 you draw a card and you get even more creatures. I think it's a rare cycle of these that probably don't make it to Constructed. Oh, here's another uh, tool for sideboard cards, Hate Bears. The uh, Flash Flying gives you and Planeswalkers you control Hexproof. Do we really need to give Planeswalkers Hexproof? I don't know. But it is a way to protect them. This uh, is a potential removal spell for control decks. Make him sacrifice an attacker and you gain two life. Again, if they're going wide, that's not as good. But it's a tool that exists. Okay. Amateur Research. Uh, one in a blue, you can go find a colorless card, put it into your hand. So that can help you find a land, can help you find artifacts, can help you find uh, cards that have a colorless mana cost. But you have to waste a couple lands to do so. Um, I think this is an interesting card. I like it for ECH. I like it for, you know, just existing. It would probably go really well with Metropolis or Ruins of Doharum with the, their artifacts. I don't think artifacts mattering is as big of a deal in Vestum. Um, but this is a really interesting toolbox card that uses the wasting mechanic. Contemplate the Source is a really fun design. Um, you just always have seven cards at the end of your turn. Or at the beginning of your turn. Of each turn. Wow. Is it worth ramping up to this? I mean, if we're already ramping up to Soul Confluence, is this better than Soul Confluence? The thing about Soul Confluence is you don't lose tempo for the card advantage because you always get to cast something else in addition to casting Soul Confluence. This, you pay seven mana for no immediate advantage. Um, this might see play as a pseudo counter spell that doesn't require two blue mana but can also get you a card later. I could see that seeing play for sure. Like in my Grixis control deck, I have some hard counter spells that cost one and two blue, but because I'm three colors, it's hard to always hit the two blue. I would enjoy this design in that deck. Uh, you can cast this to control, control of an activated ability. I guess if you gain control of a Planeswalker ability, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what this helps you with. I'm sure there's something. G 
Gene Shifter's Mark, I really love this design. It just seems like a really fun play pattern. You exile the creature, and then you reveal cards from your library until you reveal a creature card, and then you play it and attach this card to it. Um, it's basically like the Aura version of Switch Flit, except which is a, a self-mutating card in Metropolis, but that requires you to deal combat damage to an opponent, and then it mutates into something else. This constantly is mutating uh, at the end of each turn, which allows you to attack with it the following turn, and then it mutates again. This is a really interesting design. I wonder... I mean, could that be good? Could you build around that somehow? Probably not. Yeah, you could. You could have a tokens deck with this and one enormous creature like World Gorger Worm in this set, which is a 15-15 uh, amazing creature. But then you would have to exile it. So you'd only get one turn of it. A lot of interesting... Uh, it seems very carefully developed, and it seems like a lot of fun. I like that design. I don't know if it is strong enough for constructed play, but I might try and make a silly deck with it, just in case it is really good. Self-milling blue card, and you can return your salvaged cards back to your hand. So, some self-mill and card advantage. This might be an engine for some kind of self-mill deck. Did I skip something? Oh, you can uh, waste lands to flicker this um, so that it doesn't die. I think maybe this goes in a mono blue tempo deck, I suppose, so that the wasting doesn't hurt as much. Uh, return all creatures to their owner's hands, four mana. I like this design only because I really like making stupid decks with Archaeomancer and bouncing everybody and just bouncing all the creatures every turn. <laughs> over and over again. Uh, I enjoy that. And then you can gain control of one of their things later. If you bounce all their creatures, then if they play a big creature, you can just take it from them and get a card. So I like that design a lot. And it's nice for Blue to have a sweeper. Blue doesn't have one right now. I think they do have one, but it might be from Villains, and it costs a lot of mana, like 8 or something. Uh, this is a little big, but it, you know you do get to cast, you get to counter a spell, and then recast it later if you want. Ruinous Recall is one that needs to be talked about. This is one of the premier wasting cards. It's basically Ancestral Recall, except Sorcery Speed. Um, it's still one blue mana. You still draw three cards, but you have to waste three non-waste lands. So, like we talked about with Fall of Athanas and how, it, yes, it's a very appealing card, it's very below rate, or, you know, above rate as far as the costing goes, but it's much cheaper than the effect probably should be. But wasting your lands is a real cost, and this really highlights... This gives you something that is obviously always going to be really good, and shows you how real the cost is going to be of wasting. So it's a debate as to whether this card is strong, or too strong, or not strong enough, if there's a deck that can successfully play it without hurting it itself too much, which are all things I love. I love cards that are difficult to evaluate, but still appealing, because then I want to play with them to both experience the appeal of the card and also um, see who was right. Is this card too good or not? And that ticks all those boxes for me. Uh, Sand Warp. It's kind of similar, it has an optional waste, so it's not uh, an on-demand thing. You uh, cast it, encounter a spell, and then if you wasted two non-waste lands, then you can uh, cast that spell later, whenever you want. Which is really strong. I think Sand Warp might actually end up being the strongest waste card, because it's optional. And decks can run lots of these without worrying about hurting their mana except when they know it will not hurt their mana and then get a big advantage from it. A mill instant that doesn't lose card advantage because you can salvage it later. I could see... Okay, I can't really see this in the mill deck I made, 
but I know that there's nothing like this currently in custard. We don't have any stupid mill commons like this, and I would appreciate that being in the format. Just so I can make my janky mill decks. This is a really splashy mythic. You cost six mana to play him, and then you have to waste an unwaste land, but then you can play things for free. So that's pretty appealing. The wasting hoop isn't a problem to me. It's the six mana for a 3-3 that is the unappealing hoop of that creature. It's obviously a more of an ECH card. Wall of Mysteries is incredibly appealing. Uh, two mana, 0-4 Defender, enters Battlefield draw card. That's really, really strong. Uh, it can forward controls game plan as well as protecting it and defending against the matchups it has the most problems with, which are the aggro decks. Uh, very strong. It gives blue a really powerful tool. I would love to play that. Aethanos Undying. I love the design. I don't know if it's strong enough the way that um, aggro decks are these days, but whenever it gets blocked, you put a counter on their creature, and you can always cast this from your graveyard as long as an opponent has a, a creature with a counter on it. So has an interesting play pattern where you can just keep playing it over and over again as long as they keep blocking. This costs two less for each minus one minus one counter on their creatures. So you can imagine a best case scenario of two mana for four three flash flying being amazing, but you have to have three minus one minus one counters on their creatures for that to see play. And some matchups just don't feature a lot of creatures till too late, or if they do, they're all plant tokens and trying to put counters on them will just kill them. Uh, Consigned to Failure is a weird card. You can put it on... Well, I mean, you have to put it on your opponent's creature, and then they can't win the game. And then your opponent has to remove their own creature, uh, find some way to get rid of it. And uh, it's uh, kind of sadistic, right? Uh, very black design, very mythic very transgressive. I worry about things like this and that white design from Ruins of Doharun that make winning and losing the game dependent on creatures being there or not. Because not everybody runs a lot of removal. I mean, maybe they should, right? Like, maybe that's just incorrect of them, and this card just shows them that the mistake in that. But I could see this feeling really bad sometimes. Like, you're way ahead, and then just because of this one card, there's nothing you can do. Um, I think it's more likely that there's enough removal in the format that this won't actually be a problem. But something I wanted to talk about. This can almost kill anything and can't kill anything. <laughs> Which is a, a fun... Uh, I don't know, I, I just like that design, how it scales but always does the same thing. It's easy to evaluate and also just kind of interesting. Despise, already in format. A mind control for five mana, but you have to sacrifice creatures. Um, there's kind of a sub theme of putting counters on things with the greatest toughness among creatures your opponent controls. And then this lets you do it X amount of times. Um, I don't think this gets there. I think you just want to destroy their stuff. And for the amount of money, the amount of mana you'd have to pay to make sure you destroy all their stuff, um, there's board wipes you can use instead. This is a good card, 2-2 two, two Menace, for 2, which is an okay rate. And then whenever you deal combat damage to an opponent, you can exile three of their cards, and if you do, you draw a card and lose one life. The exile seems like a weird effect, except that in a world of salvage, exiling cards from their graveyard can be important. Um, I know with uh, hollows in the format, being able to exile things like their Izalith uh, could be really important, or their uh, hollow cards like you know Bonfire Keeper uh, or the Healer. And uh, another interesting thing about this design is Bob's can help you get way ahead early on, but this only helps you get way ahead if they've already cast some spells, uh, and I appreciate that. Fug, Faug, is 
Black Planeswalker seems very good. The plus one, they reveal all the cards in their hand except one, so they can always protect one of their cards. And you can choose a non-land card, and they have to discard it. It's interesting if they only have a land and a non-land card, they can just reveal the land, and they can't make you discard it. Or you can't make them discard it, I should say. Um, however, you're getting a card with the plus one, with a four mana walker, which is pretty strong. And then the minus three, you can destroy a creature unless they sacrifice two other creatures. A lot of times that will just read destroy a creature. However, um, again, with the wide format that we have, um, it will still be good, but maybe not exactly as good as you want it to be. And then I like the ultimate. It's a powerful emblem. Fuchs Quandary. They can pay five life. It's browbeat and black. Um, red is browbeat with um, what's it called? It's like flashback. Uh, Jumpstart. Uh, that is it card. And that sees some play in uh, in standard and real standard right now. I don't know if this is good enough without the jumpstart, but it does open up black as being a potential option uh, to pair with red if you're doing a burn deck, which I think you can do in this format. We have so much burn. It's all sorcery speed, though, and as well as that. Okay, four mana, destroy a creature, planeswalker, something that the format definitely has and is probably good to not run out of. It's always good to have that tool. Uh, and then you can reanimate with the salvage. This would be an interesting thing to have in a dredge deck, and if you accidentally mill that later, it could still be a really good thing. You pay seven, you gain a card, and you can reanimate something else that's ended up in your graveyard. So I like that design. This is the pushed black wasting card. I guess the white one was Fall of Athanas, and blue was uh, Ruinous Recall, and I think the black one is this. It's just a 3-2 that you can waste two lands and basically remove a creature. Um, yeah, that's appealing and that's good. The question is if you know you want to run a deck that occasionally wastes things. And there's reasons that there, there are things in uh, in this set that make wasting actively good, and we'll get to those at the end of the spoiler. Uh, Alright, dash is another mechanic to uh, you know, add some kinetic activity to the format. This, when it leaves the battlefield, you get a mutant with death touch. Sometimes this will be okay to just play as a 4-2 for 4 that retains a body when it dies. I don't know if that's quite the right rate for custard. You probably want to be doing other things at 4 mana, but it depends on your game plan. If you're an aristocrat style thing, maybe this is okay. Maybe if you're aggro, like now you have much better things to be doing on turn four if you're aggro. But it makes dash very interesting. You pay six and you get this 4-2 dash with haste and when it leaves, it leaves a zombie mutant with death touch. And those two twos with death touch are pretty good. Um, making it have death touch is bigger than many people think. This is a card that would see play, I think. When it enters the battlefield, you have to discard a card, but it has a great rate, 3 mana, 4, 5, is very strong. Is it worth always discarding a card? Depends what else your deck is doing. It'd be interesting to pair this with some hollows stuff um, and see if there's some good synergies there. But the really exciting thing is the dash cost. You can basically attack with a 4 or 5 haste for 2 mana, which is very strong, but you may have to discard a card when you play it. But if your hand is empty, then it doesn't matter. So just a lot of interesting things about this card that I enjoy a lot. I like Rider on Butcher. There's a, a great push to dash card with an interesting cost. Um, probably a bit too slow. Okay, on to red. Four mana, five four. It's probably just not fast enough. It affects combat in interesting ways, but I think it's more of a limited thing. 
Uh, Blood Rage Brawler seems a little redundant with the Rataran Butcher, but we know it's a card that occasionally saw play and constructed around the time of uh, Almond Cat and Hour of Devastation. This could see play in the sideboards of the red based aggro and gain control of their cards that they left as blockers and punch through. Crucible of the Sun. Uh, this ramps you just one mana, so from three mana to four. Not a big jump, but you also can salvage it later. So, like this card on turn three can help you cast Screecher on turn four. And then when you flood out, you can uh, dig for another threat. So I like this as a tool. I don't know that I like the design of stapling card advantage to rituals. Then it's not really card advantage, but it uh, you know kind of negates the natural card disadvantage of rituals. It is a natural salvage design, though. I think salvage wants to go on effects like the mill spell or combat tricks that normally you don't get card advantage from and this helps you do that. So I'd be interested to pair this with some of the other rituals and draw cards in the format and see if you can do something broken. Dustborn Phoenix, I like this Phoenix design. It's a 3 mana 2-2 two, two flying haste, which is obviously very good. It's evasive and fast. And then um, when it dies, if you cast a non-creature spell this turn, you can return it to the battlefield. So the problem with this is you have to have the mana up for an instant speed non-creature spell in case they try and kill it. So ideally like a shock, but the format does not have shock. It doesn't have instant speed red uh, non-creature spells that are naturally playable. So I could see this doing well in a format that had shock. Um, it could also just see play by virtue of being a 2-2 flying haste for 3, which is a little below rate of where you want to be, I think, in aggro, but it's still very appealing. So, you know, maybe there's a time that becomes good on its own. There's some Hyena Tribal that I don't think is pushed for Constructed uh, wisely so. Incandescent Rain is an instant speed, deal 2 damage to each creature. But if you don't kill the creature, it leaves a counter on it, which works with some of the other sub-themes. Huh. If you have no cards in hand, you get to draw a card at the beginning of your upkeep. Otherwise, you can loot, or rummage, I should say. Probably too slow, probably more of a limited thing. This gives all your creatures dash. Um, I don't think that's good enough. Packless Raiders, a little issue with the, the text here um, and the frame. But this card I see as being just a, a fairly solid one drop that you can play that also gets bigger and has the option of dash, so option of having haste being a 1-2 menace haste, possibly a 2-2 menace haste um, if you have other creatures. I think this pairs very interestingly with a zombie hellhound, rotting hellhound I think it's called from hollows um, in a, a very wide aggressive deck that just plays these kind of above rate hasty um, creatures that want to go wide and then maybe pairing it with white and having Solaire and having the, the healer that can help give your creatures indestructible. Uh, just very explosive and uh, that would, that's a deck that I would build if this format were to come in. I'd be looking at pairing this with Rotting Hellhound. Reaver Bandit is more of a just straight up mono red design. It's not as fast and explosive but it can grind out some advantage uh, by exiling, oh, you can steal their cards. That's not as good as being able to exile your own cards, I think, because you have less control over things that you'd want to be able to play. Um, okay, this is a five minute instant where everybody wheels. Discard your hand, draw seven cards, and then when you salvage it, you can look at their hand. So you want to do this at instant speed, probably on turn when you have six mana. And then you draw your seventh land, play it, and then you can copy all their spells. So this card in the last one 
really rely on what your opponent's doing, which feels like a weird position for red to be in, that wants to be more proactive and caring about what it's doing. But I appreciate the uh, design of all of these salvage cards that I don't think get there. This one's interesting, though. And maybe with all the red rituals, if this were to rotate in, maybe there does become some kind of weird combo deck that cares about reckless undertaking and rituals and uh, maybe some draw spells from other formats to combo off somehow. And that's something that I'd probably spend time to try and figure out. <clears throat> I hope I didn't miss the removal spell. This is a, another combo-ish dash design. Well, I mean, it's the only combo-ish dash design. Uh, it lets you copy the next spell that you cast. And this, the, the dash allows you to do it the same turn. That's the appeal of having dash on there. Sand Scour, okay? Uh, a lot of these sets are giving three mana burn, but rarely to face, just to creatures, so that there's more instant speed interaction in the format. And this makes up for its lack of dealing damage to face by offering salvage. So this becomes a very appealing uh, removal spell. And uh, would definitely see play, would be an interesting tool, and would definitely bring salvage to the forefront of the format. Shimmering Dune Kite is kind of silly. I enjoy it. Okay, we're on to green. Behold the End is one of my favorite cards on the server. Um, it's just one mana legendary enchantment, but it helps you find basic lands um, if you have the mana. So kind of grindy. You're not really getting a lot of advantage except over very grindy games, and then eventually this becomes an enormous game-ending worm with Hexproof and Trample called Worm of World's End, which is awesome. Uh, Behold the End. This is just a wonderful design. I would love if this saw play in Custard. I'm not convinced it would necessarily, but it's just a fantastic design that honestly raises my opinion of the set generally. Bitter Redemption. This is a very interesting card. Um, it feels very combo-y. Return a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand for each creature that died this turn. This combos with self-destruct sequence in Metropolis. And again, not every uh, not every set is going to be making it in, right? But the idea of these eventually being in the same format together is pretty interesting. So your self-destruct sequence from Metropolis. I know I'm supposed to be reviewing Vestum, but this is an interesting reaction that Ruben brought up specific to Bitter Revelation. If you play this on turn four, on your next turn, uh, it dies. It, it you know it it goes off, it kills all these creatures. Then you cast this, and you get to return self-destruct sequence back to your hand, and any other cards in your graveyard. So like if you have another one in your graveyard of bitter redemption, you can be looping this forever, killing everything and keep returning the ability to kill everything. Which isn't a healthy play pattern to be super competitive, but the fact that it exists uh, makes me excited. Consumption Tyrant. Oh, 7 mana, 8-8. Eight, eight. When you play it, you can sacrifice other creatures to gain life and draw cards. Um, which seems okay. I think if you pair this with... Uh, Sylvan Ritualist, I think is what it's called, from CC18, that gives all your creatures the ability to ramp. I could see you making, like, a bunch of Elvish uh, visionaries, you know, things that draw cards on ETB. A bunch of utility creatures are kind of small and cheap, but then you can tap them all to play Consumption Tyrant and sacrifice one to draw a card. I could see that being good, but ideally you want to sacrifice something that has lots of power, so maybe that doesn't quite get there. Uh, this is a 3-mana self-mill, and then you can put something on top of your library. 
it always feels bad to put things on top of your library instead of into your hand because that means it's not card advantage and now there's no fun uh, jolt of excitement when you don't know what you're gonna draw and oh this is what I drew um, it's a little slow I really like Evaldi Genesis of Hope um, this would actually work really interestingly with Rakoa which cares a lot about lands and land drops and it works also really well with wastes and wasting because if you waste all your lands and you need color again you can return those lands to your hand and you get to play an additional one so it's not like you're losing out on lands as long as you keep drawing them to play even if you are bouncing those and you can also bounce your creatures that happen to have minus one minus one counters or are enchanted in disadvantageous ways or if you have uh, really strong ETBs that you want to recur so this is a really exciting design that I'd love to see in Custard Exogene Prowler was a strong card in uh, when it was back in Tesla I think so if this card has been in custom standard before being able to choose which keyword you get uh, is actually pretty good I don't think it's as good now I think the format is a little bit stronger than it used to be but maybe not I don't know being able to have that choice that flexibility is pretty strong so maybe that sees play in mono green stompy Um, this is a Mutants Matter card, which would work really well with Metropolis. It has a few mutants, like uh, Switchflit was one card I talked about before. It has Mercy, which is kind of a birthing pod uh, creature. So there's some, and it has like just some pushed mutants for other constructed purposes. So this would work, I mean, I should stop talking about how well this set would go with Metropolis, because they can't both make it in for this rotation. But I do appreciate that it would be good with Metropolis. Uh, this ramps you two lands for four mana, but then you have to waste a couple of them. That seems strictly worse than some tools we already have in the format. I'm pretty sure we have the ability to ramp two lands for four mana, although I'm not entirely positive. So I think this only sees play if you actively want to create wastes for some reason. And there are green cards that want you to have a certain number of wastes, so that's not entirely out of... Uh, it's not entirely out of left field. Uh, Leyline Feeder is the one I'm thinking of. Whenever you deal with combat damage to a player, you have to waste a non-waste land you control. So it's it's very, you know, a 3-3 three, three for 2 is a good rate. It's not even too green for that, so it's better than Colonian Tusker, except that you have to waste your, your lands. However, once you have 6 of them, it gets even bigger. So this makes the feel bad of having to waste your lands the more you deal damage with it into a potential feel good uh, when it just suddenly becomes bigger and can end the game regardless of whether you can cast your spells or not. So I really enjoy that design. I guess this is the green, the pushed green waste card. What was the red one? Because it seemed like white had Fall of Athanas, blue had Ruinous Recall, uh, black had the creature that can remove something. I think this is greens, but what was reds? And I don't know if this was intentional by Ruben, but I think it makes sense for each color to have some way to take advantage of wastes in a uh, pushed way. 3 mana 4-3 is a good rate. Uh, it having hexproof the turn you play it is a little situational, but it makes more sense when it also has dash and you can pay 4 mana for this to have haste. So I could see that seeing play. Um, the green salvage card cheat a creature from your hand onto the battlefield so if you have worm you know a giant worm uh, that can't be reanimated but it's in your hand that's a way to cheat it out and then it lets you uh, when you salvage it you can find another copy of it and put it into play so that's fun too maybe in a ramp deck this is used to cheat out really big targets. Maybe this isn't a sideboard of a green aggressive deck. It's a 4-2 for 3, which is an okay body if you're aggressive, uh, but it also can destroy something that you need to destroy if you're worried about artifacts or enchantments. 
This is just a good mid-range card that can protect itself if you're willing to pay mana and waste some lands to give it hexproof and indestructible. This is a really interesting uh, design I've seen in several sets, this rotation. Sometimes it allows any creature for any player to fight whatever it wants. And in this case, it's only your creatures, which I think is the better design. Okay, World Gorge Worm. That's the one I've been alluding to. Um, you can't reanimate it, but you can cheat it into play with that green salvage instant, uh, and then cheat it again with the salvage side if you pull another one from your deck. Or you can ramp into it. Ramping up to 12 is kind of a difficult ask, but not so difficult when you have Garrick and Farseek and, and other tools like that. And then when it dies, you get 100 mana. I don't know what you're going to do with 100 mana, but uh, <laughs> that's just very exciting, very appealing. Uh, this is a wonderful Timmy card. I'd love it if this were in Custard and found some way to see play. I don't even think it would be the most competitive thing, but it would be fun and appealing. This might be a, a blue-white control card, just kind of a stopper to gain you some life and some card selection against aggro. Brumus Entity is really fun design. I like a lot. Uh, you can find a land if you want when you play it, or you can find a copy of another permanent which is kind of the black side, like black's ability to tutor for specific things. So I think this is a really fun design and a very interesting utility creature. Fanatical Persecution is good in tokens against other wide strategies. I could see that seeing play in the meta the way it is now. Foretold Alpha, 5 mana, 6-6, six, six, gives you some card advantage. Um, you can cast, so this is a pretty good mid-range card, gives you potential card advantage the following turn if you have, if it's a creature-based mid-range deck. Growth Blazers I like a lot, um, it just kind of scratches that Simic itch of card advantage slash ramping. Uh, it's basically just uh, Coiling, Coiling Mystic, is that what it's called? Coiling Oracle, I'm sorry. Yikes. Coiling Oracle, except it costs 3 and is a 2-3. Yeah. This is a blue-black thing where you can waste 5 cards to make it just be a 2-mana 6-5 Flash of Menace. Maybe that's a thing. I don't know. Okay, some Planeswalkers. Luma, Guiding Star. I guess one Planeswalker. I like this design. It just seems generally good. It feels red-white. It feels unique to the other red-white Planeswalkers that Wizards has already printed. I have no objection to this design. It costs five mana, so it's probably safe. Uh, you can prevent them from attacking or ping and kill something. Um, you can make some lifelink hasty tokens, which is probably the smartest thing to do when you first cast it, unless you're in survival mode. But even then, that may be the best way to survive. And then uh, dealing 20 damage to a creature and regaining a bunch of life is kind of a fun ultimate. It doesn't necessarily win the game, but it feels pretty epic. Navia Last of the Aethanis, I'm a little worried about, just because artifact spells costing one less to cast could be pretty explosive with uh, sets like Ruins of Dohrim or Natropolis also in Custard at the same time. I guess that's a, a reason that this card could be appealing. But I don't think making artifacts cheaper is always necessarily the right developmental decision. It's something I would want to watch, and I would definitely try and build decks around it to see how abusable that becomes. And it also helps you, you can blink stuff at the beginning of your upkeep. You can blink your opponent's stuff or your own. Navia's Genius is a wonderful design. Uh, it's it's like an exified um, Firemind's Foresight. I think Ruben did a really great job coming up with this design. I wanted to kind of copy it for an artifacts only version in Metropolis, uh, which I may or may not end up doing. I'd feel a little bad just kind of 
straight up cribbing the design. But uh, it's very appealing. I like it a lot. And my hat's off to Ruben for coming up with this. I don't think it's he's playing constructed at all. I think it's definitely an ECH card or a card for slower, more casual formats. Preacher of the Fault list can attack into some pretty big stuff. It can, it basically, um, it doubles the counters that get put on other things. The minus one, minus one counters. Uh, I don't think this is strong enough for Custard. There's already something that does this, but with haste. I think there's a three mana, two, two haste battle cry in uh, CC 18 or 19, whatever number it is. Okay, here's a mutant. When it enters the battlefield, you get a card. You get a basic land. And then you can pay six and sacrifice this to make two zombie mutants. Okay, that's a little more uh, limited focus than anything else, I think. Shifang Elite, if there's enough playable hyenas in Custard, and I know there's hyenas from uh, Janata which would still be in Custard if this were to rotate in now. Uh, this gives some tribal support to Hyenas, and I think there's other... Um, I think Vlad, she, the Raid Mother, also does that. And regardless, being able to dash in a 3-2 Menace for 2 is a pretty good rate. Uh, this kind of hates on your opponent's creatures. 5 mana, 4 for Vigilance. Here's Vladshi Pack Mother, that's what it is. 4 mana, 4, 2, Trample Haste. Attacking creatures get plus 1, plus 0. So really, when you play this, it's a 5, 2, Trample Haste for 4. It also helps your other creatures. And then when this dies, if entered the battlefield this turn, you return it to its owner's hand. Now, if you also have other hyenas, like Shifang Elite, then this synergizes with them. You can dash them in, and if they die, they go back to your hand regardless. Um, okay, now we're into the colorless mana symbol cards. These uh, are fascinating in the set because there's not a ton of natural support. Like there's not, there's ways of common, but not in every pack. There's not a dual cycle that, you know, that have, they're not pain lands, right? They don't have pain lands in the set. But when you waste your own lands, that suddenly unlocks the ability to cast these C matters cards, or these cards that require C. And when I say C, I mean the colorless mana. Uh, I kind of wish these had a reminder of what that was, what the colorless mana symbol was. Now, which of these cards are likely to see constructed play? That's the real question. Some people would not like it if, you know, if these cards were major force and constructed, because that would kind of invalidate some of the other colors. Um, I think Athanas Watcher is one of the most likely because it can be a 4 mana 3 3 uh, Banisher Priest or uh, gosh what's the black version where you can exile a card from their hand until it leaves the battlefield the fact you can interact with it makes me feel okay about it being outside of those colors and the fact that it's kind of hard to get C a lot of times so this is a card that would definitely see play and I think would be fine in the format. And a good payoff for creating that. Ether Conducer is more of a build around. Whenever it attacks, you put a charge counter on it, so it's basically a uh, Ether, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's a modern card. It's in the Merfolk deck, but it you can tick up and then you can play for free creatures that have the same CMC as the number of counters on the card. And this, you know, brings that design to colorless, which I think fits okay. Enigmatic Guardian, 6 mana, 6, 8, and it has weird stuff with triggers and activated abilities. I generally have very little attraction to things that call out things like triggers and activated abilities and, um, and copying and countering them. I appreciate that that would see play. That's kind of a spiky thing, but it's just not appealing to me personally. Glaring Guardian makes things lose all abilities if you choose the right card name. So it's kind of spiky in that you have to pick the right card name, like a pithing needle type thing, but it's also on a, a good evasive body. 
Uh, source conduits is a little weird. It does give you the ability to make C. You can sacrifice it to add three mana of any colors. It also has salvage for after you sacrifice it. This probably doesn't see plan constructed. Source Sentry is another contentious C design just because you know, it's a 2 mana 2 1 flyer that also finds you a land card. Uh, this actually works really well with wasting and C. Like if you waste your land such that you only can add colorless mana, you can play a Source Sentry and find the color land that you need to keep playing your normal spells. Um, and I think this being an above rate creature is fine because it's a reward for playing C. It's a reason to do it, which otherwise there's not enough competitive reasons, I think. Uh, the source lets you play cards from outside the game, but only if you control seven or more wastes. So this is a card that really encourages you to go deep on wasting. Uh, however, this allows you to add three mana in any combination of colors as you waste your lands. So it gives you the tools to keep playing your spells even as you're wasting, which I think is a good design to have in the set because a lot of people are worried, well, what happens when I waste all my lands and can't do anything? This is one of the ways that's most likely for you to waste your lands too much, but then it's not as much of a problem because you have the tools to have lots of colors. Timeless Eradicator is a little weird. Um, it's a 4 mana 5 3 that at the beginning of your end step destroys the lowest non land permanents, the ones with the lowest CMCs. So it's kind of a stabilization card. Um, if they've got tokens, they have to start losing tokens. If they don't have tokens, but they have two drops, they have to start losing two drops. Uh, you know, depending on the board state, this can be very powerful. Warden of the Eons. This is, it, it steal, when you play it, it steals their next combat phase. Uh, it's too bad it doesn't get to attack during those extra combat phases, but that's okay. This is a reason to go into uh, colorless mana. Because if you have four of it in this land, you can make them lose a life, discard a card, and sacrifice a permanent, which is really, really good. So this gives you something to do once you've wasted all your lands uh, that can help you grind out advantages in a different way. Ancient Shelter. When you cast it, you can prevent your creature spells from being countered. That's a really interesting utility land. Um, if counters become... Uh, a th too strong of a thing in the meta like if you know the the tools the control tools are too good and everybody is just playing lots of control mirrors and things like that this would be a tool to help aggro decks to fit into the meta being able to play their creatures that can't get countered that otherwise would likely be countered field of ruin is a good tool to have in custard i think um, there's non-basic lands in rakoa which could potentially get out of control. I think right now they're a little weak and Zoo plans on cranking the power level back up a bit and being able to deal with them with something like Field of Ruin would be useful. Um, this can also help fix your own land. Um, if you've wasted too much you can use Field of Ruin on your own wasted non-basic land and find the colors that you want. Fractured Remnant is a really interesting card because it helps you cast man, you know, cards of any color, but it requires you to waste something. So this probably isn't going in a wasting deck, but kind of brings wasting into other um, colorful strategies. Gorse Hand Wreckage is, you know, that's a, a strong man land. Pay two mana and two life, you get a 4-3. That's pretty good. I could see that seeing play. I like that there's just a whole suite of colorless lands that can help you cast your colorless cards and construct it, um, but they also have possible utility in other decks. Hold out Settlement. I don't think that gets there. Karn, Heart of Guilt. This is the last Planeswalker. It is 8 mana. 4 of it has to be colorless. 
and it's you know just super powerful you can make it so they can't attack you unless they pay tons of money you can make them exile a bunch of stuff of their choice you know a card from their hand non land permanent they control and the top of their library you can slowly give them emblems such that their spells all cost a lot more and then the ultimate is all those cards that you've made your opponent exile you can just put them onto the battlefield if you want this is potential utility in like removal from your lands although it's very minuscule like just sacrificing it to put a counter on one creature isn't super great probably more of a limited thing warped landscape uh, this is similar to field of ruin except um, as far as helping you dig yourself out of wasting yourself too much you can pay two and sacrifice this to find the colored land that you need so I appreciate that um, I feel like the set has been designed to give you tools to help you if you've wasted too much and there's just a lot of really interesting and fun constructed implications with wastes and with um, colorless man matters. So, uh, really excited about Vistum. Uh, I think it's a very interesting set that I would enjoy seeing in Custard. Uh, I think some others aren't as excited about the themes of, you know, using the color of your land so soon after a set that focused a lot on giving all the colors of land to everybody and lands really mattering. I think this actually makes for an interesting combination and contrast with that set and I think develops um, develops the format well in that way. Maybe that's too much attention for some people's liking but I, I would personally enjoy that. So that is my overview of this tomb. I hope that's been helpful for uh, you, the viewer, whether you are Ruben uh, getting feedback on the set or just someone looking to vote uh, on which set should join Custard next, or just someone interested in looking at custom magic sets. I hope uh, this video was useful for you, and thank you for watching all the video reviews that I've been doing. Um, I hope they've been good and helpful, and I don't know if I will always do this with each rotation, but it's something I wanted to do for this rotation uh, just to help get a lot of you know critical mass of, of good feedback that designers can use and something useful for people trying to decide what to vote for. Uh, so again, thank you for watching, and I will be doing one more video about rotation tomorrow, I believe, focusing on how I would rank these sets, um, and how I will be ranking them for my vote. Um, I invite you to look at the videos for all of the other sets that have been nominated. If there's a set you're not sure what your opinion is on yet, um, I suggest you look at my overview and hopefully that will help you know how you feel. Thanks again. Bye.